Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all again to today's webinar, Overview Properties and Opportunities for Nanocellulose, which will be given by Sean Ireland, Manager of New Technologies and Market Venture for Verso Paper Corporation and Chair of Tappy's International Nanotechnology Division. I'd also like to mention that today's webinar is being brought to you by Tappy's International Nanotechnology Division. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Sean Ireland. Uh, Sean, as I've mentioned, is Manager of New Technologies and Market Ventures for Verso Paper, and he has been since 2009. He's been an integral in working with multiple government agencies to obtain federal funding for critically needed nanocellulose research and development in the Federal Nanocellulose Center. Prior to working for Verso, Sean served in the U.S. Air Force, where he worked with all forms of weapon platforms. Mr. Allen received his commission and wings in 1990, flying F-16 Fighting Falcon, and was the commander of the 174th forward operating location until accepting a position with then Champion International. Sean is credited with several patents and has authored or co-authored seven technical papers on linear, excuse me, non-linear systems and nanocellulose technology. He is adjunct professor in the School of Chemical Engineering, University of Maine, chair of the Tappy Nano Division, and the former co-chair for the Agenda 2020 Nanomaterials and Novel Products Task Force. Now I'd like to hand the virtual microphone off to Sean. All right. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. <clears throat> if uh, something does come up where uh, my cell phone is causing an issue, please somebody let me know. Okay. So uh, one thing I'll just throw out is uh, we've got a, a large audience of different types of people, I noticed. So there is uh, a mix of technical and non-technical within this, and uh, please have patience. Uh, it's been rewritten a couple times to, uh, to kind of go for both groups, and that makes everybody happy. So let's see here. Is that working? I can't see the uh, actual show. I'm yes, it's going. Thank you. Yes. So um, as we are uh, learning to become stewards of our planet, as opposed to uh, just basically being, uh, being consumers for so long, uh, you know, we're learning to unlock a lot of nature's practices and uh, secrets. And this is actually a beautiful thing because a lot of us, uh, as we start getting in and learning it, we learn what she does right, and then we also can start learning off of some of the mistakes that we're seeing. So in terms of nanocellulose and nanotechnologies, uh, we're basically learning how to re-engineer some of these structures, but now they're doing it within our own context. <clears throat> so uh, why, you know, why cellulose? A long time ago when I was in flight school, I learned a valuable lesson that they taught us, and that was there's two important rules when you're out in the woods and you're uh, surviving. The first is if you're going to do a taste test on something that you're going to be doing, uh, living off of, you want to make sure that there's a lot of it available because there's a big risk in doing that, and you want to make sure that it's worth the effort when you do. The other one is, is never do a taste test on poison ivy. So why cellulose? Well, it's the most abundant biopolymer that's available on the planet. There's over a trillion tons of it. And then if you take just North America alone, there's over 400 million uh, available tons. And uh, at this current time, uh, we're only harvesting about a, approximately 185 million metric tons. So there's a lot of it available. We have something to work off here. So if we make nanocellulose work, we have enough material to actually get out there to the rest of the industries. So let's talk about <clears throat> what is nanotechnology. It's more than just playing around with small particles. It's actually understanding them and controlling them. And these are particles that are below uh, 100 nanometers in one, one dimension. Uh, when you get down to those scales, new phenomena comes about. Uh, things that you normally take for granted now work differently. Um, examples are, you know, we all know what gold is. Uh, you know, you have yellow gold on your ring, it's beautiful, it sparkles, but you get gold down to nanoparticles and it reacts differently. It lowers its temperature of melting drastically. Um, it's red. Uh, another thing is like aluminum, something we take for granted in our cans and things that we recycle. But down at the nanoscale, it's very reactive and explosive. So you got to know what you're doing, you got to play with it and treat it properly when you start playing into the nanoscales. And the materials that we're working with are below the size of human DNA. <clears throat> so let's talk about what, what is nanocellulose. Well, if you 
you take a tree, we're used to the concept of cutting lumber. Um, and then most of us are also understanding the concept of taking uh, pieces of wood and refining it down and getting wood pulp. And uh, that's what we see in our everyday in our tissue, in our paper, our packaging materials. When you go further than that, it's when you get into new areas that people aren't as used to. And we can take that down even further by uh, either more refining or different types of uh, tree treatments with chemicals, and we can get into cellular microfibrils. And so if you take a standard wood pulp and look at just the, 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 the actual layers that create it, there's, there's thousands of these microfibers wrapping in a single pulp fiber. But if you take one of those small microfibers, there's tens of thousands of nanofibers that once again, through chemical pretreatment or even mechanical grinding, which we'll get into later, we can bring those down and extract them out to even smaller forms, which we call cellulose nanofibrils. Now, these nanofibers are, uh, you know, about 3 to uh, 20 nanometers in thickness, and, uh, and then they stretch out to microns in length in some cases. Now, those fibrils, these elementary fibrils, are actually um, cellulose nanocrystals that are connected. They just con continue connecting through crystalline regions. And uh, every once in a while, they kink. And as they kink, that makes them a, a, a less crystalline amorphous region. And uh, if we hit that right acid hydrolysis, those amorphous regions accept the, uh, the acid just a little bit faster than the, the standard crystal, and we can break these apart. To give you an idea of the scale when you get down to a nanocrystal, if you stack 100,000 of them, it would be about the thickness of an edge of what we call copy paper. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about nanocellulose. How, how, how do we make it? So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go over a few methods. There are many. Um, but uh, I'm just going to highlight a few of the top ones there that people are making everyone aware of. <clears throat> so the first one here is uh, Tempo. Uh, tempo is a very long chemical name for tetramethyl, piperonoxyl, and uh, uh, it's basically back, uh, I, I believe it was in the 90s, but Akira, it's a guy at the uh, University of Tokyo, was accredited with, uh, with developing this Tempo process. And uh, Tempo actually creates what I would call nearly perfect nanofibers from cellulose. Um, as, it, as you take bleached softwood or hardwood craft and extra, and then uh, bring it up to about a pH of 10 at tempo, uh, room temperature, and then you just start stirring and dispersing it, and a lot of filtration. Um, tempo is at very low solids, uh, just because of the high shear viscosity that you create when you start getting nanofibers. Nano likes nano, they like to stick to each other, they agglomerate, and they also like to hold on to water. So we end up with a, a beautiful gel that's I'll show you in a little bit. Um, lots of uses for Tempo. Uh, because it's such near-perfect uh, fibers, they get very small and very close. Makes very good gas barriers, uh, nanoelectronics, separators, safer fuel cells. Uh, it's used in cosmetics, biomedical applications, and even nanocomposites. <clears throat> Speak a little closer into the mic here. Some of you guys are having a hard time with that. I apologize. Another form is uh, we get into is mechanical fibers. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm doing here is uh, I grabbed uh, 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 some slides from Hiroki uh, Yano. Yano-san is a uh, uh, amazing uh, does amazing work with uh, nanocellulose. Also, he's at Kyoto University. And uh, he's had, he had three slides that I thought were well put, so I just uh, I put his slides directly in here and uh, just uh, made sure I sourced him. <clears throat> so, mechanical. Uh, this is probably the first way of making nanocellulose. Uh, the, the earliest I found was 1949, but for all intents and purposes, they take these, uh, uh, they take nanocellulose, uh, they take cellulose pulp, and at high, high pressures, push it through either a homogenization or a microfluidization process through either Z channels or extremely small orifices and use the shear to burst apart uh, the, uh, the fibers. Um, it works good, uh, but it's very low throughput and uh, takes many, many, many cycles through to get good nanocellulose. 
uh, as, as high as like 60 passes through if uh, it's not pre-treated prior. Um, the other, other processes we have is uh, taking uh, pulp or even pre-treated pulp and then sending it through a uh, what we call a uh, Masuko has a what used to be, well, probably is still a food processor, but we use it and modify it. Uh, it's called a super mass colloider. And uh, we've been very successful at making nanocellulose with these. Uh, at reasonable quantities and uh, uh, I would say reasonable energy. Nanocellulose uses a lot of energy. Um, <clears throat> if you take tempo, have pre-treated, and you can go through a single pass of the colloider and, uh, and have very, very pretty... Uh, Clear. Uh, oh, can just read in the chat message. A very clear um, nanocellulose. Uh, at this time in the United States, we have a, a new uh, a scaled up, uh, large scale uh, mass colloider that's there for uh, doing research and development on uh, scale up of nanocellulose manufacturing. The other uh, one uh, pioneered by Janos on at Theodo University. This is uh, basically taking the twin screw extruder, and he does a lot of pre-work with his pulp first. Uh, once it's ready, he puts it through a uh, an extruder and uh, has almost a uh, uh, a plastic type of product coming out of the extruder. Now I. Uh, Colleen, I am getting a couple of uh, chats coming through that people are losing audio. Is there anything I can yeah, do on I, my end? Right. I'm, I'm just suggest that if you're listening uh, on the landline and if you uh, have a cell phone near you, please move that away uh, from you and see if that improves your audio. Okay. I get a couple other telling me they're all right, too. So. All right. Um, then uh, if you take uh, some of the best CNCs we played with in the world were made out of uh, the Forest Products Lab by Rick Reiner and Alan Reedy's group. Um, so this is their basic recipe as they go through that I borrowed off of one of their uh, presentations a while ago. And uh, CNCs are a little different. So we're, we're actually taking the pulp, getting it down to the fiber side, and then utilizing um, acid hydrolysis to break apart those uh, those amorphous regions between the crystals, uh, cook at high temperature, high uh, uh, acid levels. Um, then we centrifuge the dialysis, sonicate it to break them apart, centrifuge the tops off, and uh, then you end up with about a 30% yield of uh, beautiful nanocrystals. So what does it all look like? Um, <clears throat> Here's a, an example of some of the different hierarchies of the uh, wood fibers that we're playing with. Starting out at uh, wood pulp that we're all used to seeing uh, that work in the paper industry and making paper. Um, for decades and decades, we've had microcrystal and microfibrillated uh, cellulose. Uh, those are pretty standard in our industry and in the food industry and the packing industry. Uh, but then when you get into nanofibrillated cellulose, you start seeing these long, straight fibers that are uh, intertwined together and uh, in, in the range of about 20 nanometers or less in uh, diameter. And uh, now you start getting into properties where they're starting to hold on to a, uh, the, the reminder. You, sorry, I keep getting distracted by the question. <laughs> they'll, uh, they'll hold on to their water very, very well when you get down to these levels. Uh, through hydrogen bonds and other forces. And then we have nanocrystals. And uh, the hard part of nanocrystals is keeping them dispersed. Uh, they all like to agglomerate together, too. Um, but that, that's the, the, what they all look like together. If you look at nanofibrillated cellulose here in this picture, and there's two different types. So on the top, uh, you're seeing uh, a, a nice, clear, tempo TOCN type uh, nanocellulose on the bottom. Uh, you'll see a mechanical uh, nanocellulose. Both start from the exact same pulse, but in the end, they are different structures. And if you look, you'll see on the uh, the two AFMs of the different products, um, TLCN is um, the exact same diameter all the way through, uh, very well distributed that way, and uh, the uh, mechanical fibers tend to be different sizes and a little more glomerates through and uh, intense will disperse the, the uh, light a lot better. <clears throat> okay. 
So now let's kind of get into the uh, what what can you do with stuff? What's out there? <clears throat> so nature. So as I alluded to before, is we're we're learning a lot from nature in many many different ways. And then how do we put all these new things, new parts, new pieces together and and, and design new innovative methods? re-engineer it back into what we want it to be, but utilizing what we've been learning, even, you know, from as simple as uh, enamel and maker and seashell. I mean, if you look at that, they're very strong. It's, uh, it, there's only like 2% binder in there, but yet in paper and other products and packaging and things that we do in our industry, we use much, much, much higher levels. Um, nature knows how to actually work with photonics and and, and capture light and utilize it the way that they need it to. These are the lessons that we must bring and actually start deciphering and get good at, but not just in the lab. Um, if you look at uh, things like taking nanocellulose and, uh, and, and nanoclays and putting them together, you end up with some pretty good uh, strength and barrier properties. They work very, very well that way. Um, there's a lot of work going on in the world in this particular area. We uh, continue on. Photonics, nanophotonics. Um, when you have a lot of particles like crystalline cellulose that have extremely tight distributions on sizes and they're down way below sub-wavelength numbers, uh, you really can get into actually nanophotonics and start controlling pitch, particle size, pore sizes. Uh, how that, that gives us the ability to control how light scatters, how well it passes through a matrix, uh, we can even, in some cases, capture and control photons. And so these characteristics, you know, are also being molded, uh, molded, modeled. And uh, some of the things people that are doing that are like John Science and his group up at Oregon State um, and uh, Robert Moon, and I know uh, uh, they're doing a boat of work up at FT Innovations, uh, McGill, and Venture. There's a lot of people that are in this area and working, and uh, it's actually pretty exciting. Some examples here. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, Derek Gray's group uh, and others uh, did some work. Uh, you can see this is 1998. Um, they're actually doing some great work with uh, playing with iridescence. But what they really what they got here is that they're changing. When they start doing this, they're changing the pitch. They're changing the porosity. But the, the one thing that stays the same tends to be the nanocellulose particle itself. And by playing it, they play with the blue shift. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this happens under specific wavelengths and different colors as it goes. A uh, similar type study here is what's going on uh, a while ago with it. I believe this is in Venture. It's Tom Lundstrom in this group, as you can see on the source here. But uh, they keep layering it on, and as they layer it on, they start changing pore sizes and uh, distributions and pitches of their product, and they get a blue shift also. And so you can actually play with many, many colors, same product, same process, and, uh, and gain different photonic capabilities that come through these structures. Other parts and properties of nanocellulose. It's, uh, it's very isotropic, um, obviously, because it is a, uh, a nanoparticle. Um, the, uh, what's interesting, though, is once you hit about 6% and start going above it, you start getting into a thixotropic gel, and you really get these, uh, these, these crystalline, liquid crystalline phases there, and, uh, you can, you can look at it through a polarized lens, and you can see these, these individual, uh, uh, phases inside. Um, it's very hydrophilic, um, it's a very good reality modifier as you start playing with this inside of other, uh, other matrices. So, um, take a look at some nasty tracks here that uh, Robert Moon and uh, his group did uh, that was published in the Chemical Society. Um, the key out of this, the takeaway out of these slides, is if you look, some of the, in terms of composites, uh, Tensile, modulus, and density are the, some of the key players that people are always working on. Well, in, in this particular case, uh, you want as high a modulus as you can with as low a density as you can possibly get. And the part I'd bring your attention to is the potential for the, the large arrow I got pointing to, uh, to uh, crystalline cellulose and its capability. 
Hey, Jeff, I'll try to be a little more cognizant if I'm doing that. Um, so if we take this one step further and put the charts together, there it goes. Um, we have a nice composite here of the two previous domains. And uh, where you really want to be is you want to be up in the first quadrant. The beauty of that is, is you end up with very high tensile, very high elastic modulus, and very low densities. And uh, as you can see, carbon uh, or CNCs, carbon nanotubes, and other uh, composites that are up there, they're up in the same area. The difference being is that CNCs are made out of um, sustainable, raw, uh, renewable materials. That's the beauty of this. And the ones that are available in very large quantities through an industry that's ready to uh, move forward, I believe, uh, eventually here and once we have applications further from the lab and closer to the uh, commercial world. Continuing on is uh, there's a couple of properties when you get into um, printed electronics that are uh, near and dear to the people that are doing it. One is obviously they need to be very, very, very um, I'm sorry, I keep getting distracted from all the questions flipping back. Uh, they have to be extremely smooth. Uh, down in the 100 nanometer, 50, they prefer to be below 20 nanometers, and if you ask them, they'd take it perfectly smooth. Uh, we can't get down to perfectly smooth, but we can get down very, very low in smoothness, especially with CNC films, but they're just harder to make. Um, but the other one is coefficient of thermal expansion. And uh, what we're finding is, is that... Um, if you remove temperature and I mean, uh, humidity from the, from the equation, um, these are more stable than glass. Um, very, very, very low thermal expansion. So they make, they make great flexible electronics uh, substrates. Uh, but we won't get into the humidity side of this at this exact moment. <laughs> it's pretty poor. Um, but with a little bit of work, we can actually make that uh, get a lot better. So. Let's talk a little bit more about what are we going to do with nanocellulose. So let's talk a little bit about some of the applications, and I'll give you some visuals and what it looks like. As you can see on this picture right here, what a film, what a barrier. I mean, it, it, even though this is straight nanocellulose that's, uh, or microcellulose that's on top of, uh, of just pure paper, it looks like it's more like a plastic coating that's on top. So you can understand that this is a very smooth surface. Um, it makes big barriers. So if we look at what the barrier capabilities are, and uh, I apologize, having uh, uh, some of the data available, some of it I couldn't present, and some of it I just didn't able to get my hands on. So I've got O2. I don't have uh, water vapor. But uh, what I can talk to is when you start getting into nanocellulose, especially tempo, uh, the beauty of tempo oxidated uh, nanocellulose is that you're down to the point where you can get sub-nanometer uh, pore size. And uh, once you get down to those levels, you make some very, very good O2 barriers. Now, in terms of tempo, though, it's very reactive to the water substrate around it. So once it starts reaching uh, humidity levels, it starts opening up the pores, and then the O2 barrier goes away. So in this case, you need a hybrid-type system, and then you'd be, you'd be fine. Um, but with the mechanical grades, you can get some pretty good water vapor transmission rates. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities, but there's also a lot of challenges in this particular area. Some of the other beauties of it is, is you start putting um, light coats of nanocellulose on and you get really good uh, print densities. Uh, when you start doing that, you start increasing your contrast capability, your sharpness of your print. Um, you, you, you can increase your speed. There's a lot of things that come out of that that improves product lines. Um, something near and dear to my heart, um, you get into what we kind of call the, the all the parts and pieces of the packaging of the future. So you, you, you visualize a, uh, a container that uh, has a printed battery on inside of it that uh, has RFID built into it that is extremely strong. And then the outside has printed electronics on it that give you some media capability to get your customer's eyes onto it. Um, even better is maybe it's transparent in certain sections so they can see in it. So if they don't reach in, open up the package, see what's inside the box, and put the open box on the contain on the shelf and grab a brand new one. Um, then we talk about high, high barrier performance and beautiful 
Uh, last part that's most important to it all is it's made out of a sustainable, renewable product that uh, can be recycled back in again and utilized one more time. Other, uh, other examples, uh, these are pretty close to uh, commercial uh, that are going to be coming out sometime, I'm going to say in the next 24 months. Uh, you got organic LED substrates that are made out of nanocellulose, uh, paper batteries, printed electronics, um, very, very much being utilized. Um, these are more on um, uh, what we call PRL levels, closer to fives and sixes now. They're almost up to seven. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're beyond applied science and more into uh, product development mode now. Then we get into standards in EHS. Um, standards, TAPI has been working really co uh, closely with ISO and the Forest Service on um, developing international standards with other countries. Uh, they're going through a long process, um, very detailed, and uh, I'm really happy that there are people out there that are great at this. Um, we also uh, are doing a lot of work in multiple countries on toxicity of nanocellulose. And uh, it's been doing very, very well at every location that's been doing the work. And uh, I have not seen very, I haven't seen any negative uh, connotations for the material in its raw form. Obviously, anyone can functionalize any particle to do something. But just as itself, as a mechanical process, um, it, it's very similar as, uh, as sodium water. Oh, <clears throat> some other people are working on different things. Uh, you take, uh, i got a couple of things that are going on at Purdue here for you to look at. One is uh, they're doing a great job with recyclable solar uh, panels and uh, with nanocellulose as a substrate. And uh, they've proven it from front to back where they've made them, used them at about 2.7% efficiency, and then recycled all the components right back. Um, very interesting work right here and, uh, and has some very interesting capabilities in the future. Uh, metrology, uh, it, it started many, many years ago, about six years ago at least at Purdue uh, on uh, nanocellulose when Robert Moon uh, got there and started moving forward. And he's got a very strong program going now, uh, characterization of, uh, of uh, uh, cellulose nanocrystals. The, uh, the ball, the chemical, uh, the mechanical, uh, the barrier, and all the other stuff. And they've been doing a lot of great work with ASM. And uh, on top of that, the next thing that they've been really doing that was leading the charge was, uh, was modeling. And uh, I believe Ashley's model that she made of uh, 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 a CNC uh, crystal was the first of its kind, and that's been continuously being updated and uh, improved over time as they, uh, they learn better techniques to work with that. Um, I would really tell you to get a hold of Robert Moon on these items here, and he could, uh, at Purdue, and he'd be able to talk to these in great detail. There's a lot of great work that they're doing there. Uh, more things that they're doing is wearing, uh, working on uh, uh, different methods to align uh, through this year or other methods that uh, uh, we can't go into race here on uh, on CNC crystals within uh, within different planes. And another one that they're working on is uh, utilizing nanocellulose construction materials. And uh, it's interesting because in cements they're actually getting huge flexure changes along with high strength improvements uh, by putting CNCs and uh, nanofibers into uh, cement. Um, not quite sure if we'll be able to make enough of it for them. So let's talk a little bit more about some of these opportunities are amazing. Um, if you really kind of think about it, nanocellulose with its capabilities uh, has a promise to, to put a dog in just about uh, every industry of every industry in this race. There is uh, there's potential to, to, to touch everybody. Uh, in different ways, from biomedical, uh, which is really exciting, um, to uh, new packaging materials. And, and if you take the packaging a few steps further, it's quite impressive. If you make a lighter package that's stronger, that's more appealing to the consumer, that does everything they need, the trickle effect is you can get more packages into a uh, mode of transportation, get them there using 
less trips for the truck while at the same time utilizing less gas or diesel, as it may be, uh, less wear and tear on the roads, et cetera, et cetera. The trickles continue on and on and on. And it really goes into so many, many different industries across the board. And as you can see here, it's um, that the beauty of it also, we can make a lot of it. We have the potential to make a lot of this. Um, that, that is, uh, that's the exciting part that we get to come to. Now, I apologize for this as closing thoughts because some slides got added after I had hit this, so it's really not closing thoughts yet. Those were reminding you the end, but not there. Um, expect to see this. This is all active research. Every single one here has active research in multiple locations. Um, so from LEDs, papers, medical devices, even though people are working on clear armor, uh, food additives, reinforcements, cosmetics, composites, membranes, uh, you name it. 3D printing, it's beautiful. <clears throat> All right, so where can you get some? I hope these slides are changing fast enough for you, and I'm not going too fast. I apologize. Somebody can uh, hit me up or something if I'm going too quickly on any of it. Um, Right now, there's probably many, many locations, but the two that I have here to uh, to talk about are um, we have uh, a CNC plant and a temple plant that was made at the U.S. Forest Products Lab, Madison, that we brought online last year. And then we brought a mechanical nanofiber plant down at the University of Maine. And uh, all of these products are being clearing housed out of UMaine's uh, Process Development Center. And you can see there's the... Uh, the uh, link to it, and they have uh, prices on on the website of what the current stuff is. But in the future, um, what I'm uh, what I'm I'm going to go out on my crystal ball and say is that for for uh, cellulose nanofibers, um, what you can expect to see is uh, for mechanical side probably four dollars uh, per pound is what I, I expect them to start working out and uh, when they start coming out in good size quantity. And, uh, and maybe last, depending on volume and capability and, and relationships. Uh, in Tempo, um, it's going to be below 100, uh, I would uh, expect. Um, I just don't know how far below 100 we're going to be able to drive that in the, in the long term. And uh, I would keep a very close eye on uh, OG Paper and Nippon. Uh, they're leading the charges uh, together with Kyoto and... Uh, um, uh, University of Tokyo, and uh, and then CNCs uh, is low, even below ten dollars. Uh, truly depends on the type, the quantity, the grade of uh, of these, and that's why we need these standards so bad, so that we're not just talking about the same thing and uh, or a different product of the same name over and over. So uh, now we get to actually put in some fun plugs. And uh, as uh, Colleen said, I'm the chair of the nano uh, division in TAPI that we formed uh, two years ago. Uh, we're very active. Uh, we put out a, a quarterly newsletter that we try to bring uh, key pieces of R&D that are going on in the world by a uh, major section of the Earth planet. Um, try to give big resources for everybody to go to. If you want to have questions, you can read it, find out who's doing what, and then maybe get to them and have them help you. And uh, and then we're going to be going further um, with that in uh, terms of committees and work and other things that we're starting to, to move into. One of the other things that we do within it is uh, right here, and that is our uh, International Nanotechnology uh, for the Renewable Materials Conference. If you don't know of this, this year's conference is going to be awesome. Uh, we're in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we're right at KTH, and uh, we've got great, great uh, presentations uh, in the areas. A lot of people signed up, and uh, the conference is getting really large. Uh, looks like it's going to be a great time. We have some really good keynote speakers, and uh, it's going to be an overall uh, impressive, uh, impressive thing. We even had so many posters, we couldn't put them all in. It's a very good setup, and uh, if you want more information, uh, don't hesitate to email me. Uh, or anyone else in Tappy about this, or go to our website, uh, tappy.org slash uh, nano, or in this case, 13 nano is the complex itself, and take a look at the program. And 
then uh, something that most of you do not know about, um, but it's coming out very soon, and this is uh, this is an amazing uh, compilation of work. Um, if you've never seen it, uh, you know uh, Nist and uh, Tappy have put out um, some pretty impressive, full color, high gloss, uh, amazing uh, books on, uh, on, nano, on nano technology in the past. <clears throat> This one is a complete compilation of many different areas of nanocellulose, from nanocrystalline cellulose, nanofibrils, and uh, as you can see, it's many different uses, including EHS and other things. This was put together in a relatively short time because there was, there's been so much work pre precursored into it. it. It was time. We needed something that compiled it all into a, a high-quality thing, and uh, it's edited from uh, Mike Postrex. Robert Moon, Alan uh, Rudy, and Mike Billadel. Uh, and uh, it's going to be coming out here uh, probably in time for the conference, and then it will go on sale. And part of the proceeds for this book, just FYI, are going to go towards helping students, and uh, especially on getting students to the conferences and stuff. So um, it's not a lot of this is for lots of larger things that we're trying to do together. And... Uh, I believe, Jesus, is that the last one? It is. I believe that's it. Uh, and I thank you very much for everybody coming on. We had 86 people show up on the uh, webinar. And, uh, and that, uh, that's the overview of, uh, of nanocellulose. And I will now attempt to do my best uh, to answer some of your questions. Pauline, you're going to have to run that because I, I haven't been paying attention. That's fine. All right, we'll start with Gavin has a question. Sean, how has this been applied to paper? Could it be applied to a sheet surface with a size press as a water vapor, moisture, and or grease barrier using a palm type slug nip size press? Wow, you answered your own question with the question. Uh, the answer I would say to your question is all of the above. It works very well in all of the things that you just asked about. Um, so, uh, so nanocellulose is going to be, uh, yeah, I expect to see it coming out in, uh, in two different areas, and that's going to be uh, on barrier side and on strength improvement. Great. And the next question is from Terry. Can you comment more about the problems of humidity? Yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, even at that small scale, um, when you start putting water or high humidity into the thing, um, it likes to grab a hold of it. And uh, as it does, it starts doing its own form of, quote, swelling. And, uh, and what we end up with is, is the fibers start changing pores. And uh, as they start moving around and each one's banging for trying to get that small piece of uh, water vapor, and then we start opening up. So the thing we got to do is we stabilize it. Uh, so you put in a barrier, a moisture barrier, and then you put something on top of that that uh, will kind of help a little bit on holdout of the water. Um, or you mix it together in with another thing that uh, prevents it and cross-links it in so that you no longer have uh, the ability to have the water come in and absorb. Um, great. Leslie asks, um, is this processing cost or including the capital equipment needed as well? No, that's just the final product there that I put up for the, the, the cost per pound is, is what we expect to see in the processing cost. Uh, Karthik asks, at what concentrations do they gel? Uh, about six and a half. It, well, actually, no, that's a tough question. It depends completely on what process, what product, and uh, and, and how it was made. Uh, CNCs are about six and a half. Uh, tempo oxidized, about a tenth of one percent. Um, uh, uh, microfibrillated uh, that are, are not, I mean, nanofibrillated uh, that is mechanical grade. Um, once you get it past uh, the point of, of enough processes where you're really purely nano and you're having a hard time centrifuging it, one and a half to three is about it. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, that's a huge point that I never put in here is all of the solids that we're talking about with nanocellulose is extremely low. Um, unless we dry it, it's very, very low, and we are drying it. Um, Paul asked a question early on about the, um, hold on, I've forgotten, uh, the yield from the tempo process. 30, 35%. 
sometimes way higher. It, there's a lot of work going into that, and some of it people are not going to be willing to talk about. Okay. Uh, Sal asks, how can it be applied to non-wovens? Well, you could spray it. Uh, you could put it into the process ahead of time and the, the, uh, in the mixing. And uh, I would love to work with somebody in that area because I don't have a background in it, but I have a high interest level in it. Um, Christoph asks, in summary, what makes CNC more unique compared to other nanomaterials such as carbon nanotubes? Um, CNCs don't kill you uh, would be the first one. Um, and they're not a hundred thousand dollars a pound for a very for the, a very pure sample. And uh, you can utilize them quite well in many products and, uh, and we're not expecting them to uh, end up with uh, any uh, major government regulations behind it as we move into this further. Um, but uh, you know, on the downside, they're hydrophilic. Um, they have uh, issues with going into certain types of solvents and other ones they take readily to. Um, but they also can go into aqueous-based products and uh, CNTs are a little tougher in that area. That's a good question, though, for um, uh, John Simonson. Uh, he's done some work in those areas, too. Um, Anne asks, if you dry an FC, can you regain properties after re-wetting? Um, that is a yes with some caveats. It depends on the properties you are looking for, obviously. Um, when you dry NFC and then you bring it back in, um, if you're drying CNCs, um, we, we we're able to get a lot of uh, agglomerates back apart, but it's not perfect. When you dry NFCs, it's the same way. Once you reach a certain point level of hornification, it doesn't come back out. Um, but for the most part, for most of the applications that people utilize this stuff for, with the exception of high-performance composites, Drive nanocellulose can come back into an aqueous format and be utilized very well. But um, in some of the high composites, uh, those small um, minor agglomerates that we can't get rid of are crack propagators and cause many, many issues in terms of nanocellulose uh, and composites after drying. James asks, the keys seem to be dramatically upping yields per ton of wood and reduction of chemical waste streams. What's the state of the art today and what threshold level needs to be achieved? How many years away to less than 50%? Or, excuse me, how many years away to greater than 50%? Well, it um, depends again. If we're talking nanofibrillated cellulose, it's 100% yield. So that's a very good yield. I can put in one ton and get one ton out. And uh, if I'm talking nanofibrillated cellulose, I mean, a nanocrystalline cellulose, well, I should start using the standards that I'm trying to preach. Cellulose nanocrystals, um, it's, it's a different part there. And, and here it goes to um, how you would really extract it out. You don't have to kill everything and throw it all down the sewer. You can, you can pull out certain pieces and end up with a pretty high yield of crystalline cellulose, uh, cellulose crystals while at the same time uh, still having pulp fiber for use. So... I would say state of the art is uh, uh, above 35 uh, is what I would comment on right now. And, and crystalline cellulose, uh, how far above I can't comment on with people's work. And uh, nano uh, cellulose nanofibers, uh, it's 100%. Great. I just want to let everyone know that's still on uh, the call right now that we will be sending Sean's presentation out in PDF form after the webinar today. We have a lot of questions about that. Uh, Dinesh asks, how to make NC resistant to moisture? <laughs> um, that would be a, uh, uh, a question I can't really go into right now, um, but I would give you um, my reply to that would be uh, there are a number of scientists that I, I reference within here and uh, abroad that have that or come to the conference, and I'll introduce you to 50. Sandeep asks, uh, now cellulose likes to hold water. How does this impact drainage and paper making if the CNS is added to pulp, and how can this be overcome? Well, um, I can tell you with a small amount of effort, you can move the dry line down to your wrapper. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it does affect drainage, uh, but you also don't need to put it in uh, in a manner that does that. 
So uh, that's a that's a, a difficult question to answer in this type of a format. But uh, I will tell you that it does affect drainage, obviously. Uh, but what you do is you do other things to offset that and then utilize what it does give you and uh, minimize what it hurts you with. Roy asks, what's the difference between NCC from hardwood and softwood? The cost. Uh, Roy also asked, does NCC test on human skin toxicity? Yes. Uh, it's been done with NIH and NIOSH. Uh, I know Canada has done it and Europe has done it too, and uh, they're all coming back uh, with um, non-toxics. I've got two more questions from Christoph. How easy is CNC dispersible in alcohol, methanol, ethanol? Uh, not very, but with a little effort you can do it. But, uh, you know, um, by themselves they will separate. Um, if to follow up to that, uh, Christoph says some polymers, PP, uh, polypropylene, polystyrene, polyphene, have high melting points. How to handle CNC when mixing then used um, using melt compounding process? Uh, a lot of work in that. Um, none of it I can comment on, uh, on on what people are doing, but uh, he is correct, and uh, and I can I can say that that has been overcome. Uh, Roy asks another question about NCC absorb UV or reflect UV. Well, I guess it's going to absorb UV. Uh, it will break it down. Um, and uh, but you know you can always put in UV stabilizers to help it with it. Um, and I have a comment um, from Renee at Celluforce. He says that far, the FP Innovation Celluforce process for CNCs is currently at approximately fifty percent yield. I think oh, that's, that's excellent! Comment. I didn't want to state that, so that's very good. Thank you, Renee. Uh, David has a question. Uh, what about migration testing and food contact stimulants? Any knowledge on this area? Well. It, it's in your food right now um, in, uh, in multiple locations, so, um, but, but that's all I have right now. Um, my, uh, my take on that one would be that probably the Canadians have way more information in that particular area, and uh, that's where I would probably drive that question to. Great. Paul asked, does NFC quality form craft pulp versus mechanical pulp differ? Um, that's that again. Uh, does MSC quality from craft pulp versus mechanical pulp differ? Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah, massively. Yeah, craft pulp quality um, is the Cadillac. Um, and so our last question, so if anybody else has any more questions, please uh, enter them in the chat box. Andy asks, projected timeline for commercial availability for nanofibrillated cellulose. Uh, there are many, many, many pilot plants up right now. So uh, the timelines today, um, you've got uh, Cellular Forest with a plant that's in, uh, up, up in uh, Canada right now for um, small-scale quantities, but not, not it's small in terms of paper industry. Um, you've got uh, the small plants that we have in the U.S. right now, then you've got plants from Store Anso and UPM that, uh, that are under construction and going on. You've got Nippon Paper has announced theirs. Um, Inventure has theirs. And I know I'm leaving some key players out. I apologize because I'm doing it off the top of my head. Uh, but there's a number of um, uh, what I would call demonstration plants to um, small commercial size plants right now. Um, and the only reason I say small is that we tend to use uh, hundreds of millions of tons in a lot of work that we do globally, but the reality is, is that this is going to be talked in terms of tons per day uh, out of a plant. I, I hope that answers your question, but you can find that on the web or, once again, come to a uh, conference, and I can introduce you to everyone that's doing that because they are all there. Another question from Christoph. What areas of research are close to commercialization? <laughs> Um, hmm. uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say um, I, I, I don't want to answer that one. I, mm -hmm. I apologize, but there are a number of them, a very large number of them, uh, and, and I don't want to give out anybody's information. 
Um, and Christoph also wanted to mention that Alberta Innovates, or AITF, in Edmonton, Alberta, has an NCC pilot plant. Um, another question from James. Drying CNC requires and consumes lots of power. Can you comment on this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, 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 everything about nanocellulose itself is, uh, is, tends to be in the megawatts. Um, there are a lot of people that talk about, um, you know, we can do it at a very, very low, low power, but when you follow it all the way back to the tree and then bring it back to the final product and through its entire cycle, um, it's still a lot of power. Period dot and uh, but I mean what I would point everyone to is that um, 15 years ago it was 100 megawatts you know five years ago it was 10 megawatts and now we're down to one megawatt or less um, so and then when you start drying again you start adding a lot more power back into it and um, but it's not um, it's not a crazy amount that prevents commercialization it's just more than we're used to doing something in. James um, has a thought, one megawatt per what? Pardon me? Um, he's asking one megawatt. You were talking about power requirements. Yeah. Per what? Per what unit? Oh, oh, per ton. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, per pound. <laughs> no, <laughs> per pound, per ton. Um, and while we're waiting for any last-minute questions, I would ask everyone that's on the call today, when you exit out of the web-based um, software, you'll be asked to complete a survey. I please encourage you to take the time to um, provide comments there. Uh, Sean will be getting all of those comments, so if you would like him to contact you or send names or more information, please edit that information. We very much appreciate your feedback. I have another question from Roy. Does NCC um, has been added to make commercial product? Uh, I am not aware of crystalline cellulose in a commercial product at this particular point, um, and uh, but I, I do have my uh, my concepts on it, but we can't talk about that right now on who I think and where. Um, again, last call for questions. I have uh, I have no others coming through, Sean. Yeah, that's fine. I got four minutes before I turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> Well, great. Well, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And again, um, thank you, Sean, for spending the time to share with us uh, the, the, the great opportunity put forward by nanocellulose materials for the forest product industry. Again, thank you all for attending. And again, thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for giving me time. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time and patiently going through that with me. <laughs>